Section 4 of The Island of Dr. Moreau by H. G. Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Tom Hare. 3. The Strange Face. We left the cabin and found a man at the Campion obstructing our way. He was standing on the ladder with his back to us, peering over the combing of the hatchway. He was, I could see, a misshapen man, short, broad, and clumsy, with a crooked back, a hairy neck, and a head sunk between his shoulders. He was dressed in dark blue serge and had peculiarly thick, coarse black hair. I heard the unseen dogs growl furiously, and forthwith he ducked back, coming into contact with the hand I put out to fend him off from myself. He turned with animal swiftness. In some indefinable way the black face thus flashed upon me shocked me profoundly. It was a singularly deformed one. The facial part projected, forming something dimly suggestive of a muzzle, and the huge half-open mouth showed as big white teeth as I had ever seen in a human mouth. His eyes were bloodshot at the edges, with scarcely a rim of white round the hazel pupils. There was a curious glow of excitement in his face. "'Confound you!' said Montgomery. "'Why the devil don't you get out of the way?' The black-faced man started aside without a word. I went on up the companion, staring at him instinctively as I did so. Montgomery stayed at the foot for a moment. "'You have no business here, you know,' he said in a deliberate tone. "'Your place is forward.' The black-faced man cowered. They won't have me forward. He spoke slowly with a queer, hoarse quality in his voice. Won't have you forward, said Montgomery in a menacing tone. But I tell you to go. He was on the brink of saying something further, then looked up at me suddenly and followed me up the ladder. I had paused halfway through the hatchway, looking back, still astonished beyond measure at the grotesque ugliness of this black-faced creature. I had never beheld such a repulsive and extraordinary face before, and yet, if the contradiction is credible, I experienced at the same time an odd feeling that in some way I had already encountered exactly the features and gestures that now amazed me. Afterwards it occurred to me that probably I had seen him as I was lifted aboard, and yet that scarcely satisfied my suspicion of a previous acquaintance. Yet how one could have set eyes on so singular a face and yet have forgotten the precise occasion passed my imagination. Montgomery's movement to follow me released my attention, and I turned and looked about me at the flush deck of the little schooner. I was already half prepared by the sounds I had heard for what I saw. Certainly I never beheld a deck so dirty. It was littered with scraps of carrot, shreds of green stuff, and indescribable filth. Fastened by chains to the mainmast were a number of grisly staghounds, who now began leaping and barking at me, and by the mizzen a huge puma was cramped in a little iron cage, far too small even to give it turning room. Farther under the starboard bulwark were some big hutches containing a number of rabbits, and a solitary llama was squeezed in a mere box of a cage forward. The dogs were muzzled by leather straps. The only human being on deck was a gaunt and silent sailor at the wheel. The patched and dirty spankers were tense before the wind, and up aloft the little ship seemed carrying every sail she had. The sky was clear, the sun midway down the western sky. Long waves, capped by the breeze with froth, were running with us. We went past the steersman to the taffrail and saw the water come foaming under the stern and the bubbles go dancing and vanishing in her wake. I turned and surveyed the unsavory length of the ship. "'Is this an ocean menagerie?' said I. "'Looked like it.' said Montgomery. What are these beasts for? Merchandise? Curios? Does the captain think he is going to sell them somewhere in the South Seas? It looks like it, doesn't it? 
said Montgomery, and turned towards the wake again. Suddenly we heard a yelp and a volley of furious blasphemy from the companion hatchway, and the deformed man with the black face came up hurriedly. He was immediately followed by a heavy red-haired man in a white cap. At the sight of the former, the staghounds, who had all tired of barking at me by this time, became furiously excited, howling and leaping against their chains. The black hesitated before them, and this gave the red-haired man time to come up with him and deliver a tremendous blow between the shoulder-blades. The poor devil went down like a felled ox, and rolled in the dirt among the furiously excited dogs. It was lucky for him that they were muzzled. The red-haired man gave a yop of exultation, and stood staggering, and, as it seemed to me, in serious danger of either going backwards down the companion hatchway, or forwards upon his victim. So soon as the second man had appeared, Montgomery had started forward. "'Steady on there!' he cried, in a tone of remonstrance. A couple of sailors appeared on the forecastle. The black-faced man, howling in a singular voice, rolled about under the feet of the dogs. No one attempted to help him. The brutes did their best to worry him, butting their muzzles at him. There was a quick dance of their lithe, grey-figured bodies over the clumsy, prostrate figure. The sailors forward shouted— as though it was admirable sport. Montgomery gave an angry exclamation, and went striding down the deck, and I followed him. The black-faced man scrambled up and staggered forward, going and leaning over the bulwark by the main shrouds, where he remained, panting and glaring over his shoulders at the dogs. The red-haired man laughed a satisfied laugh. "'Look here, Captain!' said Montgomery, with his lisp a little accentuated, gripping the elbows of the red-haired man. This won't do. I stood behind Montgomery. The captain came half round and regarded him with the dull and solemn eyes of a drunken man. Wa won't do, he said, and added, after looking sleepily into Montgomery's face for a minute, Blasted sawbones! With a sudden movement he shook his arms free, and after two ineffectual attempts stuck his freckled fists into his side pockets. "'That man's a passenger,' said Montgomery. "'I'd advise you to keep your hands off him.' "'Go to hell,' said the captain, loudly. He suddenly turned and staggered towards the side. "'Do what I like on my own ship,' he said. I think Montgomery might have left him then, seeing the brute was drunk, but he only turned a shade paler and followed the captain to the bulwarks. "'Look you here, captain,' he said. "'That man of mine is not to be ill-treated. He hath been hazed ever since he came aboard.' For a minute alcoholic fumes kept the captain speechless. "'Blasted saw bones!' was all he considered necessary. I could see that Montgomery had one of those slow, pertinacious tempers that will warm day after day to a white heat and never again cool to forgiveness, and I saw, too, that this quarrel had been some time growing. "'The man's drunk,' said I, perhaps officiously. "'You'll do no good.' Montgomery gave an ugly twist to his drooping lip, He's always drunk. Do you think that excuses his assaulting his passengers? My ship, began the captain, waving his hand unsteadily towards the cages, was a clean ship. Look at it now. It was certainly anything but clean. Crew, continued the captain, clean, respectable crew, you agreed to take the beasts. I wish I'd never set eyes on your infernal island. What the devil want beasts for on an island like that? Then that man of yours understood he was a man. He's a lunatic, and he had no business aft. Do you think the whole damn ship belongs to you? 
your sailors began to haze the poor devil as soon as he came aboard. That's just what he is. He's a devil, an ugly devil. My men can't stand him. I can't stand him. None of us can stand him, nor you either. Montgomery turned away. You leave that man alone anyhow, he said, nodding his head as he spoke. But the captain meant to quarrel now. He raised his voice. If he comes this end of the ship again, I'll cut his insides out, I tell you. Cut out his blasted insides. Who are you to tell me what I'm to do? I tell you I'm the captain of this ship, captain and owner. I'm the law here, I tell you, the law and the prophets. I bargained to take a man and his attendants to and from Erica, and bring back some animals. I never bargained to carry a mad devil and a silly saw bones, but... Well, never mind what he called Montgomery. I saw the latter take a step forward and interposed. He's drunk, said I. The captain began some abuse even fouler than the last. Shut up, I said turning on him sharply, for I had seen danger in Montgomery's white face. With that I had brought the downpour on myself. However, I was glad to avert what was uncommonly near a scuffle, even at the price of the captain's drunken ill-will. I do not think I have ever heard quite so much vile language come in a continuous stream from any man's lips before, though I have frequented eccentric company enough. I found some of it hard to endure, though I am a mild-tempered man, but certainly, when I told the captain to shut up, I had forgotten that I was merely a bit of human flotsam, cut off from my resources, and with my fare unpaid, a mere casual dependent on the bounty or speculative enterprise of the ship. He reminded me of it with considerable vigour. But at any rate, I prevented a fight. End of section four.